My name is James Franco, and I'm just an ordinary office worker. My life is pretty boring, just going back and forth between work and home every day with nothing special to talk about. When I first started working, I dreamed of climbing the corporate ladder, but I'm not good at making calculated moves because of my personality. I often end up with jobs that nobody else wants to do. My inability to say no is my own enemy. Even though I work hard, I'm still a regular employee with no title to my name. However, there was a time when I used to be a lot happier and smiled more. I married my girlfriend, whom I had been dating since the start of my working life. We had a happy marriage, which motivated me to do well at my job. But that happy life didn't last long. Are you telling me to live on this meager amount this month again? A few years into our marriage, my inability to succeed at work frustrated my wife, and she often showed her irritation. I'm sorry, I do my best, I would say. How many years and how many times have you repeated those words? I thought marrying you would mean a better life, but with this low salary, we can't do anything. I'm fed up. My wife Rachel has always loved spending money on herself, from beauty treatments and cosmetics to nails, hair salons and clothes. She was happiest when keeping herself beautiful. It seems she married me believing that life would be luxurious since I am a doctor's son. Indeed, my dad is a doctor and owns his own clinic. But my dad, who had a personality similar to mine, often saw his patients for almost charitable rates. He often provided care without profit for patients who were hesitant to seek treatment due to financial constraints. People can pay back when they recall it in the future as long as they are alive to do so. Money can't be made if you're not alive, my dad used to say. Because of this, despite being a doctor's family, we never lived a wealthy life. Of course, as a child, I never felt unhappy or questioned our way of living. I'm still proud of my dad to this day. However, Rachel decided to marry me because she thought being a doctor's son meant wealth without knowing the real story. So our life turned out very different from what she had planned. A few years later, Rachel said, I've had enough. If this is all we can do, there's no point in being with you. Let's get a divorce. A divorce? Hold on, please. I pleaded. How many years do you think I've waited? I age just as much as you do. I need to redo my life while I still can. I definitely don't want to be a low-income wife like you for the rest of my life. With those harsh words, Rachel left, leaving only the divorce papers behind. I was mad at myself for not realizing Rachel's true nature and for not being able to prove her wrong with my job performance. Six years have passed since then. I threw myself into work to heal the emotional wounds, but being not savvy, I still couldn't achieve outstanding performance at work, remaining a regular employee. If this continues, what Rachel said would turn out to be true. I feel utterly miserable. During that time, an envelope arrived in my mailbox. It was from Rachel. What does she want now? I wondered. Inside the letter from my ex-wife, who I hadn't heard from in a long time, was a wedding invitation. It seems Rachel is remarrying someone else. Why would my ex-wife send me an invitation? I thought. As I looked at the postcard, puzzled, I noticed a familiar chapel name written on it. This place, isn't it a super luxurious hotel? Knowing Rachel, she must have chosen a rich man to be her partner this time as well. I could easily guess that she intended to flaunt her happiness in a luxurious hotel wedding just to show the difference between her life now and the life she had with me. I don't owe her to attend. I mean, I was the one who got dumped, but maybe for Rachel too, me not succeeding in my job was an unexpected turn of events. After pondering for a while, I sighed deeply and stood up from my seat. This is the last time. I guess I'll just go. I knew attending the wedding would hurt my pride but I decided to go anyway. Despite everything, Rachel stayed with me for several years. I can somewhat understand her desire to show me that she's finally happy as a form of revenge. From an outsider's perspective, she might seem too kind-hearted. On the day of the wedding, the weather was perfect. I arrived a bit earlier than planned and, while sipping my coffee in the lounge, stared blankly out the window. It was her second wedding, so I recognized a few of Rachel's friends who I had met before. Unexpectedly, I overheard a conversation from the seat next to me. Rachel did an amazing job to get this wedding, didn't she? One person said. Yeah, it's in a luxury hotel this time. It's a level up from the first one, another replied. She used to complain that her first husband was a doctor's son, 
but when she found out he was just an ordinary office worker without money, it was really unexpected, wasn't it? Hearing them talk without realizing I was there, I felt a sharp pain in my heart. So Rachel never really liked me for who I was. I realized that when we got divorced, but hearing it from someone else made it even harder. Before she divorced her first husband, she had already set her sights on her current husband. They continued, really well done, Rachel. Well calculated. I couldn't believe my ears. So, Rachel was already in a relationship with her current partner before she even divorced me. My pride was shattered to pieces. She looked down on me so much, but she was the one cheating. I started to regret even being there. Trying to maintain my composure, I took another sip of my coffee, but my hand was shaking. Rachel appeared in front of me, all prepared to move to the bridal room. You really came. You're really a good person, right? She said, sneering at me. Trying to hold back my anger, I responded, Well, consider it my last duty. Glad you could find happiness. I forced a smile. Not liking my attitude, Rachel continued to belittle me. Isn't it wonderful? It's incomparable to the time with you. Here's a share of happiness for the poor bachelor. Be grateful, will you? She laughed sarcastically. Just then, a refreshing looking man spoke to her from behind. It was the groom, her new husband. Rachel, it seems like the relatives have gathered, let's hurry to the bridal room. Her husband Scott glanced at me briefly and gave a slight nod. I nodded back reflexively. Perhaps the groom didn't know Rachel had invited her ex-husband to the wedding. There's still some time before the ceremony, so please make yourself comfortable, Scott said with a pleasant smile as they were about to pass by me. At that moment an older man following the groom spoke to me. Excuse me for asking, but may I have your name? Dad, what's wrong? Scott asked. Ah, uh, nothing, just curious, the older man replied. Feeling uneasy under the groom's dad's serious gaze, I responded, my name is James Franco. Franco, is your father a doctor by any chance? The groom's dad suddenly seemed frantic. Staggering a bit under his intense presence, I nodded. Immediately, the color drained from his face, and he raised his voice. Scott, the wedding is off right now. What? What are you talking about, Dad? Scott exclaimed. Caught off guard by this unexpected turn of events, I hurriedly stood up from my seat. No, I didn't do anything, I said, still in a state of panic. The groom's dad began to prostrate himself at my feet. People around the venue started to murmur and stir. Dad, what are you doing? No, really, what? Scott urged his dad to lift his head, but he stayed bowed down, pressing his forehead to the floor. I was completely lost and had no idea what was going on. Rachel, caught in this embarrassing situation, turned red with anger and started to lash out. Can we just talk about this? Lift your head, please, I said, trying to calm the situation. I persuaded the groom's dad to lift his head, and he began to plead for forgiveness, tears in his eyes. I'm begging for your forgiveness. I've been unfaithful to Dr. Franco, he said. It seemed that the groom's dad, Gary, had some past connection with my dad. To understand the truth, I listened intently to Gary's words as he began to speak hesitantly. Gary was a fellow doctor like my dad. The story dates back to my early childhood when Gary was still a trainee doctor at the hospital where my dad had just started his own medical practice. My dad was known for his skills at a well-known university hospital. Gary, who was a student at the Associated Medical School, looked up to him. He volunteered to train at my dad's hospital and learn various techniques. One day, Gary's wife gave birth, but the baby was found to have a serious heart defect. The heart surgery needed was risky, and the chances of survival were slim, which made the other doctors hesitant to perform the operation. Desperate, Gary consulted my dad. My dad agreed to help and successfully performed the heart surgery, saving the baby's life. However, the medical expenses for the baby's condition were very high. Gary, being a trainee doctor at the time, couldn't afford to pay it all at once. With tears streaming down his face, he bowed deeply and asked my dad if he could repay the amount in installments. My dad just laughed and shook his head. Someday, when you become a great doctor and have the time to remember me, come back and repay me then. I guarantee you'll definitely become a great doctor, he said, to keep Gary from feeling too pressured. Sometime after, Gary was sent abroad to study medicine and didn't return to the States for several years. 
Despite this, he never forgot his promise to my dad and continued to save money for the repayment. However, by the time he came back to the States, my dad's hospital was no longer there. The contact information had changed and they had lost touch. Not being able to repay the money had always weighed heavily on his heart and he had lived all those years without being able to do anything about it. Today, he happened to see me at the hotel and was shocked. He said I looked just like my dad used to. I'm truly sorry. Please, I'm begging you, let me meet your dad in person and apologize to him, he said, feeling Gary's intense emotions. I responded calmly, that sounds just like my dad, but he passed away five years ago from cancer. Hearing the news, Gary stood there in a daze. No way, he whispered, shocked. Yes, I said softly, he passed away just like that. Until then, he had been moving from one clinic to another. He was a wonderful doctor, always considering his patients until the very end. Kneeling on the floor, Gary broke down in tears. Dad, this isn't the place, Scott said, trying to calm his father. That scar on your chest, that's proof that Dr. Franco saved your life. Scott seemed to lose his words. He looked at me, then back at his father, confused and emotional. You're able to have a wedding ceremony and be here today all thanks to Dr. Franco, Gary said, his voice shaking. He bowed to me again. I want to repay all the kindness I couldn't repay to your dad. Please, let me do something. I quickly lifted Gary's face and extended my hand to help him stand up. Mr. Gary, I'm really happy. Just remembering my dad is enough for me. The life my dad saved is now able to celebrate such a wonderful day like today. Being able to see the proof of my dad's existence makes me happy. I'm sure my dad would be happy too. Hearing my words, Gary started crying out loud again. The onlookers began to cheer and applaud, moved by the emotional scene. Rachel was the only one glaring at me with a look of fury. As the time for the ceremony drew near, I stood to the side, watching the event unfold. I couldn't help but reflect on the day's surprising turn of events. Scott and Rachel continued with their preparations, but there was a noticeable tension in the air. Gary stayed close to me, his eyes red from crying. I'm so sorry for everything. Your dad was a great man, and I failed him by not finding him sooner, he said, his voice still shaking. Mr. Gary, I said, placing a hand on his shoulder, you didn't fail him. My dad helped you because he believed in kindness and compassion. He wouldn't want you to feel this way. Just knowing that you remember him and are grateful is enough. Gary nodded, trying to compose himself. Your dad's legacy lives on in you, he said, attempting a smile. He would be proud. The ceremony began and I found a quiet corner to observe from. Rachel and Scott exchanged their vows, but I couldn't shake the feeling of disconnection from the event. My mind was flooded with memories of my dad, his dedication, and the values he instilled in me. As the ceremony concluded, guests mingled and congratulated the newlyweds. Gary approached me once more. James, if there's anything I can ever do for you, please don't hesitate to ask. Your father saved my son, and I owe him everything. I smiled warmly. Thank you, Mr. Gary. Just keep living with the same kindness my dad showed you. That's the best way to honor him. Rachel approached, her expression still cold. Enjoying the show, she asked sarcastically. I took a deep breath. Rachel, I didn't come here to cause trouble. I came to pay my respects and to wish you well. She scoffed. Well, mission accomplished. Now you can leave. I nodded, understanding her anger but feeling no need to respond further. As I turned to go, Scott stepped forward, extending his hand. Thank you for coming, James. It means a lot. I shook his hand. I wish you both the best. Take care of each other. Walking away from the venue, I felt a mix of emotions. The day had brought closure to some old wounds and opened my eyes to the enduring impact of my dad's kindness. It wasn't the outcome I expected, but it was a powerful reminder of the values that truly matter. I had an unexpected experience that changed my wounded heart into feelings of pride and happiness. Afterwards, Gary insisted on repaying the medical expenses and the kindness my dad had shown. He gave me a substantial amount of money that he had saved for my dad. Additionally, Gary's hospital started doing business with my company. This significantly boosted my performance at work, and I finally got promoted. The kindness and compassion my dad had shown came back to me in a wonderful way. 
I cherish this happiness while remembering the serious look in my dad's eyes when he was working. My dad's dedication to helping others had a lasting impact on me and on those he helped. His legacy was not only in the lives he saved but also in the values he instilled in me. As for Rachel, her second marriage didn't turn out as she had hoped. Her husband eventually found out that she had dated me before our divorce and that her motivations for both her previous and current marriages were driven by money. Over time, he grew tired of her behavior, and this led to another divorce. I heard about it through the grapevine. It was a reminder that what goes around comes around. Living by my dad's example, I believe that even if something doesn't benefit me directly, it can still bring happiness to someone else. This belief guides my actions every day. Today, I saw someone smile, and just knowing I contributed to that happiness reassures me that my life is heading in the right direction. Reflecting on these events, I realized how much my dad's principles had influenced my life. His approach to helping others without expecting anything in return had come full circle. The money Gary gave me was a tangible reminder of my dad's generosity, but even more valuable was the recognition and respect his actions had earned. At work, my newfound success wasn't just about the promotion. It was about knowing that my dad's legacy had indirectly contributed to my achievements. Gary's hospital partnering with my company was more than a business deal. It was a testament to the long-lasting effects of kindness and integrity. Rachel's situation served as a contrasting lesson. Her focus on material gain led to temporary happiness, but ultimately resulted in loneliness and loss. It was a stark reminder that true happiness and fulfillment come from genuine connections and helping others, not from selfish pursuits. Every day, I strive to live by the values my dad taught me. I take pride in helping others, knowing that even small acts of kindness can have a profound impact. Seeing the smiles of those I help is more rewarding than any material gain. It reassures me that I am on the right path, one that my dad would be proud of. My journey from a wounded heart to a place of pride and happiness has been shaped by the lessons my dad imparted. His life was a beacon of compassion and selflessness and I aim to follow in his footsteps. The unexpected twists and turns have only reinforced my belief in the power of kindness. As I move forward, I carry with me the memories of my dad's dedication and the impact he had on others. His legacy lives on not just in me but in everyone who experienced his kindness. Each day is an opportunity to honor his memory by continuing to spread happiness and support to those around me. In conclusion, the experience with Gary and the changes in my life have shown me the importance of living with integrity and compassion. My dad's influence continues to guide me and I am committed to making a positive difference in the world, one act of kindness at a time. Ever since I ended up in a wheelchair due to an accident three years ago, my husband and mother-in-law have become much colder towards me. One night, my husband said something I couldn't believe. Sorry but could you please leave this house for a moment? What? What do you mean? I asked, shocked. I mean exactly what I said. My mother and I talked it over and decided, he replied. Are you saying you want a divorce? I asked, trying to understand. Yes, that's it. I've been thinking about it for a long time now. You can't earn any money, so I don't need you, he said harshly, as if he was squeezing blood from a stone. I understand. Thanks for everything and thanks for leaving me with nothing, I said, getting up. I left, knowing it would take them some time to realize the meaning of my words. My name is Linda Gray. After graduating from university, I have been working at my current company for seven years. Well then, I'll be heading out. Thanks for your hard work. Thanks for your hard work too, a colleague replied as I closed my laptop and got up from my seat. I looked at the clock by the window and saw it was already four hours past my regular working time. An afternoon meeting had run late, and I had been preparing for a conference and responding to emails, which took longer than I expected. I left the office, got in the elevator, and went down to the first floor. As I walked through the automatic glass doors at the entrance, I saw that the sun had already set. I checked the train schedule on my phone as I left the company gate and headed to the nearest station. On my way, I saw two of my husband's colleagues walking in the same direction. I wondered if Jack, my husband, was already home. 
We had stopped talking about work at home recently, so I had no idea if he was busy. Talking about work at home had been making Jack cranky, so we naturally stopped discussing it. As I rode the train home, I stared out the window, lost in thought, watching the scenery go by. When I was dating Jack, we used to finish work at the same time so we could go home together. But for the past year or two, our schedules have been completely different. On the train, I noticed a young couple near the door, maybe college students, having a fun conversation about a movie they saw recently. Their happy scene reminded me of my own past, and I had to close my eyes tightly to stop the emotions from overwhelming me. I'm home, I called out as I opened the front door, took off my shoes, and saw the neatly lined up shoes in the entrance. It seemed everyone else was already home. I heard the living room door open behind me and the sound of slippers coming closer. Welcome home, Linda. You were late today, my mother-in-law, Jessica said warmly. I'm home, mother-in-law. I'll start preparing dinner right away, I replied. Oh no, you don't have to rush. You're tired from working overtime, aren't you? she said kindly. Not really, I said cheerfully. The afternoon meeting ran late, but things should settle down soon. I walked with Jessica to the living room. After getting married, it was just Jack and me. But last year, when his father got sick and was hospitalized, we moved into his parents' home and have been living as a family of four ever since. Welcome back, Linda. You've had a tough day, haven't you? My father-in-law? who was reading the newspaper on the living room sofa, greeted me warmly. I'm back, I replied with a smile. Last year, he had a sudden brain hemorrhage and needed emergency surgery. While his condition was serious for a while, he has fully recovered after his rehabilitation. He is calm and friendly, and I liked talking to him since the first day we met. He used to be the head of the finance department before he retired and he often gives me useful advice on managing the household budget. When I visited, we finished preparing dinner and gathered around the table as a family. Jessica mentioned that Kelly, who came over for lunch the other day, had a daughter named Jolie who had grown a lot. Kids grow up faster when they're not yours, I responded. Kelly is as beautiful as ever, and having a child really makes her look even more graceful, Jessica continued. I guess so, I replied. Kelly is Jessica's niece and Jack's cousin. Jessica often seems disappointed that Jack and I don't have children. She's not very happy that I continue to work after our marriage and often hints that she would like us to have a child whenever we meet. Honestly, I've always found it hard to deal with Jessica, especially since we started living together. She tends to bring up the topic of having children especially on days when I come home late from work. You could have had a child if you had started earlier, Linda. But I suppose it can't be helped because you're busy with work, she said. I nodded along, feeling uncomfortable. I glanced at Jack, who was quietly eating his meal without looking at me. Jack and I were colleagues at the same company and got married in our third year of dating. We were told that it would be best if I became a housewife if we had a child, but we have both continued working since our marriage and haven't had any children. Both of us have wanted a child and tried everything from herbal medicine to medical tests, but nothing has worked. Despite a sense of loneliness, we decided to keep living as a couple and focus on our work. However, I started to feel a distance growing between Jack and me. We got married out of love and promised to make each other happy, but our relationship has gradually become cold. I think it started when Jack began having trouble at work. He didn't tell me anything, but I heard from a senior colleague in his department that Jack was struggling because he couldn't keep up with his peers. Jack is a gentle person who doesn't handle pressure well and tends to push himself too hard. I knew without him saying anything that he was feeling anxious and frustrated about the situation. But whenever I tried to offer him support, he would refuse to talk about his worries, insisting that he was fine and that I shouldn't worry. So he continued to keep his feelings to himself. I couldn't push him to open up, and I felt helpless that I couldn't be there for him. 
Even so, on our days off, we would make an effort to travel together or spend a relaxing day at home, enjoying our time together as a couple. When I felt drained from our unsuccessful attempts to have a baby, Jack was always there, quietly supporting me. That's why, even if I couldn't solve Jack's problems directly, I wanted to be by his side, providing comfort and peace. The turning point came when I got a promotion at work. I was recognized for my achievements on the projects I worked on and was one of the fastest among my peers to get promoted. That's amazing, congratulations, Linda, Jack had said. I can't forget the look on his face when he congratulated me. I was so touched that I could only manage a simple thank you. As my work got busier, the distance between Jack and me seemed to grow. We spent less time together, our conversations became fewer, and when my income surpassed Jack's, we hardly even made eye contact anymore. I would watch Jack as he finished his meal in silence and then left the table without a word. I can't help but wonder if I hadn't been afraid of being pushed away and had tried harder to support him, would we have a different relationship now? When I opened my eyes, the first thing I saw was the bright white light of a fluorescent bulb. After blinking a few times, I looked around and realized I was lying in a hospital bed. I looked down and saw an IV in my arm, and both of my legs were wrapped in layers of bandages and casts. The moment I tried to move, an intense pain shot through my body. Tears welled up in my eyes from the sheer pain. My body felt as heavy as lead and it seemed impossible to move. What on earth had happened? I tried to recall my memories leading up to that moment. I remembered going to work as usual, finishing a meeting and report, and leaving work on time for the first time in a while. After leaving the office, I was heading towards the station, which was busier than usual because of rush hour. Then I heard the screeching sound of sudden breaks from behind me. I turned around and felt a violent shock. I realized I'd been hit by a car. Fear and pain spread through my body. I worried about the condition of my body now. I heard footsteps approaching, and suddenly the curtain around my bed was opened. Oh, Mrs. Gray, you're awake, but you shouldn't try to get up yet, said a young female nurse in a rushed tone. I understand you're confused, but your doctor will explain everything shortly. Please stay calm for now. Ah, uh, okay, I replied and the nurse left in a hurry. A few minutes later, the doctor arrived and explained what happened. Apparently, a truck driven by a sleepy driver crashed onto the sidewalk, and I was hit from behind. I had been rushed to the hospital immediately after the accident, and it had been about half a day since the surgery. Excuse me, but have you contacted my family? I asked. Yes, we have informed your husband and his parents about the accident and that the surgery went well. However, they seem to be out somewhere and can't come right away, the doctor said. I see, thank you, I replied. Jack was away on a business trip, and his parents had been on an overseas vacation since last week. From the doctor's tone, I could imagine their reaction to the news. Even though they were out, it didn't sound like they responded as you would expect when being told a loved one has been in an accident. I laughed bitterly, Thinking about Jack's reaction, it didn't seem like he would be worried about me. The doctor continued to explain that while there were no life-threatening injuries, the damage to both of my legs was severe. They said the chances of walking again were not good. As I listened, it felt surreal, like they were talking about someone else, not my own body. Jack visited the hospital four days after the accident. It was surprising to see his pained expression when he saw me covered in injuries, lying in the hospital bed. Sorry, he said, looking genuinely distressed. I'm late. It's fine, don't worry about it, I replied. I'm sorry for interrupting your business trip. It had been a while since we last talked, and the atmosphere was awkward. Our conversation stalled, and we both avoided eye contact. Jack then excused himself to talk to the doctor, leaving the room. I couldn't bring myself to call out to him and just watched him leave. It's been two and a half years since the accident. My legs are still disabled from the accident, and I've been confined to a wheelchair. 
Since the accident happened while I was leaving work, I managed to stay with the company for a while, but it became too hard to continue, so I resigned about five months ago. Since then, I've been spending my time at home, but a few things have been bothering me. One thing is Jessica's attitude towards me. It's gotten much harsher than before. Linda, do you have a moment? Yes, of course. I'm about to head out, but could you fold the laundry for me? It's just folding, so you can do it even if you can't move your legs, right? Yes, please be careful on your way out. Well then, please get it done. Ever since I started staying at home, I've been getting more and more snide comments from Jessica. She seems unhappy that her daughter-in-law is at home all day and not working. Now, every time we meet, her requests come with a side of sarcasm. I sigh as I folded the laundry. The other thing that's been on my mind is Jack's job. According to a former colleague, Jack seems to be struggling at work more than ever. He's being outperformed by younger colleagues and subordinates who joined after him. He seems to be viewed as a burden by those around him. He used to keep to himself after coming home from work, but lately he's been taking out his frustrations on me more often. Must be nice, Linda. You don't have to worry about work relationships anymore, and you get to eat without having to work. I heard from mom that you've been lazing around all day doing nothing. I wish I could have that lifestyle just once. I no longer saw any trace of the kind Jack I once knew. His sarcastic remarks left me feeling sad for the man he had become. One night, he said, I hate to ask this, but could you please leave this house? I was at a loss for words, unable to understand the meaning of his abrupt statement. What? What do you mean? I mean exactly what I said. My mom and I have talked it over and decided. I turned to look at Jessica, who was sitting next to Jack. Linda, ever since you quit your job, you haven't contributed to the living expenses or helped around the house. You've just been staying at home all the time. To be blunt, it's a nuisance for you to stay here any longer, she said. I, I don't. Don't you think it's rude to live off others without making any contribution to their household? Jessica continued, a triumphant look in her eyes. Jack remained silent, avoiding eye contact with me. Jack has a tough job too. Just because you're married, he doesn't have to support you anymore, she added. I looked at Jack, who was staring down. Jack is asking me to leave. Is this your way of saying you want a divorce? Yeah, that's it. I've been thinking about it for a long time, he replied. So, after all this time, you have no feelings left for me. Why would there be? Of course not, Jack said, his words spilling out like a flood. Do you know how miserable I feel every time I see your face? You must have looked down on me, thinking you were better than me every day. It felt like the threads of our relationship were unraveling one by one. I tolerated you because you were contributing to the household expenses but things have changed now. You're just someone who neither works nor has money, he said, clenching his fist, his words cutting like a knife. I don't need you now that you can't earn money. The last thread snapped. I understand, I said. For the first time, Jack looked at me. But I have a condition. All the divorce procedures will be handled through a lawyer. If you agree to that, I will pack my things and leave within the week. Sure. That's fine, right, Jack? Jessica said. Jack nodded silently. Well then, that's how it is, Jack, I said, jolting him out of his silence. Thank you for everything up until now, and thank you for leaving me with nothing, I said before walking out. A few days had passed since I left the house. When I checked my phone, I saw a call from Jack. I stared at the screen for a few seconds before picking up. Yes. Linda, I'm sorry. Could you please come back? He said. What's this all about all of a sudden? I asked, surprised by his change of heart. I heard from my dad that even after you quit your job, you've been covering our living expenses. You've been investing since you were working, haven't you? And now you're able to cover living expenses with the money you make from dividends, Jack said, his voice tinged with regret. Yes, that's right. 
So what? I responded, not sure where he was going with this. I left the household budget to you and my dad, so I didn't know anything about our finances. I thought we were living off my income, but now I realize we were mostly living off yours. I really regret saying such terrible things. I'm sorry, Jack continued, his tone softer, almost pleading. After we got married, we merged our finances, and I began investing my own money. My father-in-law encouraged me to invest, and he was the only one I talked to about financial management and investments. Jack never showed any interest in our finances, leaving it all to his dad and me. So, what am I supposed to do if I come back? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Well, my dad says that with my income alone, it's impossible to maintain the same standard of living we've had. Besides, I'm not confident that I can keep my current job for much longer. I'm struggling at work, and I don't know how much longer I can hold on, Jack admitted, his voice breaking. So what you're saying is you want me to come back so we can live comfortably? I asked, my anger rising. You really have some nerve. There was a long pause on the other end of the line, and I could hear Jack breathing heavily, trying to find the right words. The reason I never said anything before is because, even though my feelings have changed, I believed that deep down, you still cared about me. But you're not the Jack I once loved anymore, I said, my voice trembling with emotion. That's not true, Jack said quickly, his voice full of desperation. I still care about you. I've just been going through a lot, and I've made mistakes. I know I've hurt you, but I want to make things right. Please, come back. I sighed, feeling the weight of the years and the pain we had both endured. Jack, it's not that simple. You've hurt me deeply, and it's not just about the money. It's about how you've treated me, how you've taken me for granted. You've become someone I don't recognize anymore. I know, and I'm truly sorry. I've been a fool, and I've let my pride get in the way. I miss you, and I miss us. I want to make things right, but I need you to help me. Please, Linda, come back, Jack pleaded. I need time to think, I said, feeling the tears well up in my eyes. You can't just expect me to come back and pretend everything is okay. We need to talk about this, really talk, and figure out if we can find a way forward together. Okay, I understand, Jack said, his voice barely above a whisper. Take all the time you need, just know that I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make things right. As I hung up the phone, I felt a mix of emotions. Part of me wanted to believe Jack, to believe that he could change and that we could find a way to rebuild our life together. But another part of me was deeply hurt and uncertain if I could ever trust him again. I knew that whatever decision I made, it wouldn't be easy, and it would take a lot of time and effort to heal the wounds that had been inflicted over the years. I still love you, Linda, Jack said his voice full of desperation. There's no need for you to say anything more, I replied firmly. All my feelings for you have vanished. The last time we talked, I made it clear that whatever happens to you and your family from now on, I just don't care. Thank you for leaving me with no trust, no memories, nothing at all, I continued, my voice cold and unyielding. Wait, Linda, please forgive me, Jack pleaded, his voice breaking. I'll handle all the divorce arrangements through my lawyer. Don't ever contact me again, I said, my tone final. I hung up the phone and immediately blocked his number, cutting off any further communication. After that, the divorce process moved quickly, and I made a clean break from Jack. The only person I still kept in touch with was my father-in-law. One day, my phone rang. It was my father-in-law. So have you had any trouble living alone since you split up with Jack? He asked kindly. No, not particularly, I replied, feeling a bit relieved to talk to someone who genuinely cared about my well-being. That's good to hear. I'm sorry for the trouble we caused you, Linda. When I heard what happened from Jack and my wife, I was so angry that I couldn't help but shout. I shouldn't have ignored the terrible way my wife and son treated you for so long. I'm truly sorry that I didn't do more to help, he said, his voice filled with regret. It's okay, sir, 
Please don't worry about it, I replied, trying to ease his guilt. Actually, I caused some trouble too. After I left, things didn't go well at the house. Even without my income, Jack and Jessica kept living extravagantly without cutting back on their lifestyle. They ended up pawning their belongings and even went into debt. My father-in-law, frustrated with their irresponsible behavior, recently divorced his wife. I see this as a good chance to rethink my life, I continued. I can live just fine with my current lifestyle, and I want to take on new challenges. I feel optimistic about the future, even though things have been tough. That's the spirit, my father-in-law said, a hint of pride in his voice. You've always been strong, Linda. I have no doubt that you'll come out of this even stronger. After hanging up, I reflected on how much my life had changed. I had always been the one to keep our household running smoothly, managing our finances and making sure everything was in order. After we got married and combined our finances, I began investing my own money with the encouragement and guidance of my father-in-law. Jack had never taken an interest in our finances, leaving everything to his father and me. Since the divorce, I've had to make some adjustments, but overall, I've managed well. I've learned to live within my means, cutting back on unnecessary expenses and focusing on what truly matters. I've also started taking on new challenges, exploring new hobbies, and reconnecting with old friends. It hasn't been easy, but I've found a sense of independence and self-reliance that I hadn't realized I was missing. Reflecting on my relationship with Jack, I couldn't help but feel a mix of sadness and relief. We had once been so in love, but over time, our relationship had deteriorated. The pressure from his job, the expectations from his family, and our struggles to have a child had all taken their toll. Jack had changed, becoming someone I no longer recognized. His coldness and lack of support had driven a wedge between us, and no matter how much I tried to reach out to him, he had pushed me away. When I finally made the decision to leave, it was the hardest thing I had ever done. But now, looking back, I realize it was also the best decision for both of us. Jack needed to face his own issues, and I needed to find my own path. The divorce proceedings were straightforward, thanks to the help of my lawyer and the support of my father-in-law. He had always been kind to me, treating me with respect and offering his wisdom and advice on financial matters. Even after the divorce, he remained a source of support, checking in on me regularly and offering his assistance whenever I needed it. I learned that after I left, the household fell into chaos. Without my financial support and management, Jack and Jessica continued to spend recklessly, refusing to cut back on their lavish lifestyle. They eventually had to pawn their belongings and even went into debt. My father-in-law, frustrated with their irresponsibility and fed up with the constant stress, decided to divorce Jessica. Now, I see this as a chance to reassess my life and set new goals. I've been focusing on my own happiness and well-being, taking things one day at a time. I've found new strength within myself and a renewed sense of purpose. I've also started to explore new opportunities, whether it's a new hobby or a potential career change. Life may not have turned out the way I expected, but I'm determined to make the most of it. As I laughed cheerfully with my father-in-law over the phone, I felt a sense of relief and hope. The future is uncertain, but I'm ready to face it with a positive attitude and an open heart. I'm grateful for the lessons I've learned and the support I've received, and I'm excited to see where this new chapter of my life will take me. I don't think marriage should be about money, but some people really care about wealth more than anything else. My sister-in-law, Laura, is one of those people. I never thought greed would become such a big issue over an inheritance after my brother, a well-respected surgeon, died. I'm Julia Roberts, I manage a jewelry store, and I'm happy being single at 35. However, I've been thinking about marriage since my boyfriend recently proposed. Our families are getting together tomorrow to celebrate our engagement, but I can feel tension brewing. My older brother Kyle, who is a well-known surgeon in Paris, 
has always looked out for me and taught me a lot because he's much older. He jokes about checking out my boyfriend as if he were my dad, which makes me laugh. But I can tell he's a bit worried. Kyle's marriage to Laura, a very beautiful woman with questionable morals, really shows the conflict between looks and true character. Despite their glamorous life, Laura's love for luxury puts a strain on our family relationships. Her need for expensive things often comes before her promises, leaving us let down and upset. At first, we overlooked Laura's behavior, thinking it was because of the pressure to look good. But as she started skipping more family events, our patience started to wear thin. Her decision to cancel on tomorrow's gathering at the last minute for tea at a fancy hotel is a perfect example of her selfishness. While we wouldn't mind her not being there, it's her lack of thought for others that really bothers me. I'm tired of always bending over backward to accommodate her every whim. I tried to talk to my brother about it, but his weakness for Laura stops any serious conversation. He just apologized for the inconvenience and tried to reassure me. He promised he would talk to her about her actions. I'll be there tomorrow, he assured me, convincing me to drop the issue for now. What bothers me the most isn't just Laura's selfishness but also how she gets my busy brother to say sorry for her and do her tasks, even though she doesn't work and could handle them herself. Despite being at home full-time, Laura doesn't do housework, she hires cleaners and prefers to eat out. Her days are filled with shopping for brand-name items, leaving little time for real responsibilities. The next day, our family meeting went well, and my boyfriend won everyone over. It was a nice gathering, although it didn't last long. That evening, just as I was relaxing, Laura called out of the blue and started yelling. She demanded scones and macarons and scolded me for neglecting her. Confused, I tried to talk to her calmly, but she kept shouting. Despite my efforts to explain, Laura kept demanding, paying no attention to reason. She even demanded a souvenir from the hotel and had so many other unreasonable expectations that left me both puzzled and tired. What should have been a happy evening ended with me feeling exhausted and annoyed because of Laura's unreasonable demands and outbursts. I wondered how Kyle managed to find peace in his daily life with Laura's constant mood swings. What made him marry her in the first place? While her beauty was obvious, her self-centered nature was off-putting. I thought maybe she was spoiled because of her looks. I was worried for Kyle, but I knew I shouldn't interfere with his marriage. It was his choice, after all, and he had always respected my choices too. The next day at the jewelry store where I work, I saw Laura outside, walking arm in arm with a man around her age, probably in his late thirties. They were chatting comfortably as they came into the store. I paused before going over to them. Laura acted like nothing was wrong when she saw me, which made me even more uncomfortable. When I asked about the man with her, Laura said he was just an old friend from her modeling days. Still, seeing them together, especially since she's married, made me feel uneasy. As Laura looked at the jewelry, she boldly asked if she could get an employee discount, seemingly unaware that this was inappropriate. I calmly told her we don't offer such discounts. Honestly, I didn't like the idea of her friend buying things for her, and she seemed slightly annoyed when I told her the discount wasn't available. Laura picked out some items and left, leaving the man to pay the bill. This made me wonder about their relationship. That evening, I decided to talk to Kyle about what I saw, but when I called him, he seemed really down. Kyle, what's wrong? I asked, noticing he was upset. I had my suspicions about Laura, but I didn't mention them. When I tried to talk about my upcoming wedding, Kyle seemed distracted by his own thoughts. He talked about saving for our wedding next year and invited me over, but didn't say much about Laura. His uncertainty made me curious. Although I tried to discuss the wedding details, Kyle was noncommittal and ended the call abruptly, asking me to meet at our parents' house without explaining why. Maybe he wasn't feeling well. Kyle, a dedicated surgeon, 
often puts other people's needs before his own health, and this tendency of his to ignore his own health worries me. Despite his jokes about the risks of his job, I couldn't stop thinking that his non-stop work schedule was wearing him down. I doubted that Laura, with her self-centered attitude, could give him the support he needed. Kyle sent an email later outlining the plan for a gathering at our parents' house. When I got there, I was shocked to see how pale and worn how he looked, worse than ever before. I asked him how he was, but he just gave me vague answers about being busy with work. Finally, I gathered the courage to talk about Laura's recent actions. I told him about her visit to my store with a young man and wondered aloud if she was deceiving him again. Laura's past actions had always worried me, and I couldn't overlook them any longer. I've been too busy with work to pay much attention to her, my brother confessed. Our parents were upset by her absence at the gathering, which gave me a chance to bring up my concerns. When I asked Kyle about Laura's absence, he said solemnly, Laura isn't here today, which is why I asked you all to come. I have a favor to ask. With a serious look, Kyle shared some shocking news. Despite our shock, he stood firm, leaving us stunned. Five months later, tragedy struck as my brother died from stomach cancer, a result of constant stress and overwork. It was a harsh truth to face. Despite his commitment to saving others, he had neglected his own health. He had started to see signs and went through tough tests that confirmed his illness. We wished he had told us sooner. Tears flowed at his funeral, surrounded by a deep feeling of loss. I remembered all the ways Kyle had supported me during my early challenges. His death before he even turned 20 left us overwhelmed with grief. Yet during our mourning, Laura's actions were glaringly obvious. She wore a flashy necklace to the funeral, a gift from another man, showing no respect for the solemn occasion. Her insensitive behavior was unbearable. Overcome with anger, I confronted her. Why are you wearing that? I asked, my voice shaking. Don't you realize how much my brother cared for you? Laura just smiled, seemingly untouched by the seriousness of the situation. I know, she replied carelessly. It's just how the world works. If you're so unhappy, why did you marry me? Her harsh words really hurt, and I had to hold back my anger in front of my brother, our parents, and the others. It was clear that Laura didn't care about my brother's memory at all. Her selfish behavior and her careless talk about their marriage and waiting for her inheritance made me furious. Before I knew it, I almost slapped her, but a man by her side caught my hand. He then introduced himself as a nurse who had worked with Kyle and was here to look after me at Kyle's request. I was confused in trying to understand everything going on. Despite the sadness of the funeral, hearing the laughter of the nurses and doctors, who were Kyle's colleagues, brought me a moment of comfort amidst the chaos. I turned to the nurse who had stopped me during the laughter for some clarity. His reply was straightforward. Did the doctor leave any inheritance behind? Your family should know. His words hit home. I knew very well that my brother hadn't left any inheritance. But Laura, not knowing this, became hysterical. She started accusing us of plotting against her to take the money for ourselves. She was sure she would soon get a large sum of money. As Laura's accusations grew louder, the nurse's amusement turned into full laughter. Seeing things getting out of hand, my dad stepped in, calm but assertive. Do you really not know? He asked her. Eager for answers, Laura demanded to know what was going on. I obliged, sharing the details of my brother's financial arrangements during his lifetime. He had set aside 20 million euro, specifically for my wedding, and had other generous gifts planned as well. As this reality dawned on Laura, her expression changed dramatically from shock to pale disbelief. My brother, although highly respected for his medical expertise, was known for his lavish spending habits. He indulged in extravagant parties, exclusive dinners, and luxurious accommodations as a way to relieve the stress from his demanding career and family responsibilities. Despite his intent to share these joys with Laura, 
she was notably absent during both his challenging and celebratory moments. It was not Laura who stood by him during tough times. Instead, it was his colleagues and friends, the very people who were now gathered to pay their respects, who supported him. The nurses, whose laughter had earlier filled the room, began to share poignant memories of my brother's acts of kindness and generosity. They recounted how, despite his hectic schedule, he always made time to look after them, hosting gatherings that left a lasting impression. Their stories deepened their admiration for him, inspiring them to strive harder in their own careers. As they spoke, they revealed another significant act of kindness from my brother, the donation of the remainder of his estate to the hospital. Representatives from the hospital were present and expressed their gratitude for his contribution, which would help alleviate their annual struggles with research funding and improve future medical care. Witnessing the extent of my brother's compassion towards others, I couldn't help but feel a pang of disappointment towards Laura. While he had impacted so many lives in such positive ways, Laura, who should have been his closest companion, displayed nothing but selfishness and greed. Months later, Laura contacted me, her tone as demanding as ever, eager to secure what she believed was her rightful inheritance. However, her careless management of the estate affairs revealed a shocking truth. Despite my brother's considerable earnings, his assets were nearly depleted. In her pursuit of the mansion and other properties, Laura had overlooked the fact that Kyle had accumulated significant debts. This oversight left her with only a fraction of what she had anticipated. Her pleas for help were met with no sympathy, as her earlier behavior had alienated those who might have otherwise been inclined to assist her. I made it clear to Laura that with Kyle's passing, the family ties that loosely bound us had effectively dissolved. Her behavior throughout had spoken louder than any words could, revealing her true motives despite her claims of affection for my brother. I could potentially help you out of this trouble, I told her, but how can you expect that after you've been so blatantly selfish? My voice was tinged with disbelief and disappointment as I spoke. Laura's response was fraught with impatience, a stark contrast to the composed facade she usually maintained. She was grappling with the new and harsh reality of inheriting not only the mansion, but also the substantial debts that came with it. I reminded her, somewhat coldly, that inheriting meant taking responsibility for both assets and liabilities. I even pointed out that she had the option to renounce the inheritance within five months of being informed. The suggestion that she might sell the luxury items she had amassed over the years to cover the debts only elicited a flood of tears and desperate pleas for forgiveness. Despite her remorse, or perhaps because of the insincerity I felt underlined it, I found myself unable to offer any consolation. The conversation ended with a heavy heart on my part, as I was unable to reconcile her past actions with the cherished memory of my brother. Following Kyle's death, the plans for my wedding had to be postponed by a year. During this challenging period, the cloud of depression lingered over me, a stark reminder of the loss and betrayal I had experienced. Recognizing my distress, my husband and his family extended their heartfelt understanding and support. Their compassion was a beacon of light during a time darkened by loss and disappointment. Determined not to let the memory of my late brother down, I vowed to live a life of gratitude, channeling my energies into supporting and acknowledging those who had stood by me through thick and thin. When the wedding finally took place, it was not just a celebration of union, but also a tribute to Kyle's lasting impact on those around him. His popularity and the respect he commanded among his colleagues became poignantly evident as many of them visited his grave to pay their respects. They shared stories of his generosity and kindness, especially towards his co-workers, further cementing his legacy as a man who had genuinely cared for others beyond the confines of family and personal gain. Through these reflections and tributes, the wedding became a dual ceremony of love and remembrance, intertwining my new beginning with the honoring of a life that, while tragically cut short, 
had profoundly touched many. This convergence of joy and sorrow underscored the complexities of life and the enduring influence of genuine connections forged in both joyous and challenging times. I was always concerned that my brother's generosity might make him vulnerable to those looking to exploit his kind nature. However, the overwhelming support from friends and colleagues after his passing reassured me that his goodwill had been genuinely appreciated, not taken advantage of. Meanwhile, news about Laura's decline began to circulate within the jewelry industry and among our social circles. Known for her lavish lifestyle and a series of questionable relationships, she painted a stark contrast to my brother's legacy of generosity and integrity. Laura, who had once lived in luxury, was now forced to sell her opulent mansion due to her unsustainable spending habits and the mountain of debt she had accumulated over the years. Now, she found herself living in modest accommodations, a far cry from the grandeur she was accustomed to. Her financial downfall was a topic of quiet discussion and served as a cautionary tale about the perils of living beyond one's means. Reflecting on Laura's misfortunes, I couldn't help but feel vindicated in my long-held belief that marrying for money was a fundamentally flawed motivation. It was clear that Laura's priorities had led her to a lonely and challenging path, whereas my brother's focus on kindness and giving had earned him lasting respect and love from those around him. Motivated by these reflections, I vowed more fervently to honor my brother's memory by protecting his legacy. He had spent his life not only as a skilled surgeon but as a pillar of support and generosity in our community. In his professional life, he was revered not just for his medical expertise, but for his willingness to go beyond the call of duty to assist his colleagues and patients alike. At home, he had always been my protector, guiding, and supporting me through life's challenges. Determined to keep his spirit alive, I engaged more actively in community service and charity work, areas my brother was passionate about. I organized fundraisers and volunteered at the hospital where he had worked helping to fund the programs he had started or supported. These efforts brought me a sense of closeness to him, a feeling that I was continuing his work in some way. Moreover, I took steps to ensure that the stories of his kindness and generosity were remembered and celebrated. I shared these stories at community gatherings and on social media, ensuring that his legacy would inspire others as much as it inspired me. The positive responses from people who had been touched by my brother's life encouraged me to keep sharing and celebrating his life. In doing so, I found a profound sense of purpose. While Laura's life seemed to spiral into chaos as a result of her choices, I found strength and fulfillment in upholding the values my brother had taught me. This contrast between our paths was a stark reminder of the different outcomes that result from our life choices. By choosing to embody my brother's principles of generosity and support, I not only honored his memory but also enriched my own life, making it fuller and more meaningful. Through these actions, I not only kept my brother's memory alive but also ensured that his legacy of kindness and selflessness continued to impact the community, proving that the values he lived by were his true lasting wealth. I started the divorce because I saw that a spouse who was financially struggling wasn't valuable to me. My world was turned upside down when, on a business trip, my husband suddenly told me he wanted a divorce and that he was already married to his lover. To make things worse, he accused me of marrying him just for his money and demanded that I give up any rights to our property. Facing my indifferent husband, who had always looked down on me since we got married, led to his complete downfall. My name is Lisa, I'm 40 years old. I was raised by a single mother after my father died when I was in kindergarten. Despite the financial hardships, we found happiness as a family of three. Even now, with a decent job and salary, I still live frugally because of my upbringing. I married Larry, a wealthy man I met through a friend. I was drawn to his kindness and the new possibilities he introduced to me. After we got married, our different views on money and gender roles became clear. 
Larry imagined a traditional home where I would stay at home, but I was committed to my career and staying financially independent. Before we married, Larry suggested I become a housewife, assuming I would accept traditional roles. However, I made it clear I wanted to keep working until we had kids, pointing out the financial advantages. I managed to convince him, but the reality of balancing work and home responsibilities was hard. Even though I worked full-time, I still had to do all the house chores, leaving us little time together. Meanwhile, Larry, sticking to a traditional husband's role, did nothing at home. He just enjoyed his dinner and relaxed when he got home. Trying to balance work and home life strained our relationship and made me wonder if this was really what marriage was supposed to be like. I was afraid to tell Larry how unhappy I was because I thought he might make me quit my job, even though he didn't help at home. I hoped that having children might improve our relationship, but we were becoming more distant, making me doubt we could start a family. Feeling it was urgent to talk about this, I approached Larry. Hey, we should think about having kids, right? I said. Kids? You're pretty energetic for someone tired from work and chores, he replied. It's not about that. I want to have children. We haven't been married long, but I'm already over 32. Women can only have children for a certain time, and it's getting harder for me to conceive as I get older. It's almost too late. But we don't need kids. If we have one, you'll expect me to help, right? You know I'm busy with work and won't help with raising children. Isn't it strange to say you won't help with child rearing even before they're born? I plan to raise them alone, but shouldn't you at least want to help? It's your child too. Child rearing is your job. I'm working to support the family, so I definitely won't help with the kids. You'll just complain that I don't help, making me the bad guy. You must have been taught to be poor and have lots of kids since you were born. We're not poor. We don't need kids. End of discussion. Larry abruptly ended the conversation and went to his room. Alone in the living room, I broke down in tears. My desire for children was not only rejected, but he also mocked my upbringing. After this, our relationship got worse quickly. We barely talked, and the hope of having children faded as I continued to balance work and home duties. Taking on significant projects at work, I found myself growing more distant from Larry. One day, as I told him about an upcoming business trip, his unexpected kindness caught me off guard. He wished me well and hinted at a big surprise when I returned. Despite having given up on him, his smile made me hope. But my hope was crushed when I came back. The front door wouldn't open. Larry had changed the locks. His first surprise was announcing our divorce. He claimed to have faked my signature and filed the papers with a friend as a witness. Inside, he handed me a document to sign, giving up my rights to any property division and protesting the false accusations. I insisted that we both give up our rights to any property, and I wanted this to be a public agreement. Larry stubbornly argued and revised the document on his computer, leading to a tense argument as I left the house. He kept mocking me for being poor and even thought about throwing out my things. A few days later, Larry called me in a panic. What did you do? he asked. I haven't done anything. Why are you panicking? I have many questions. First, I was told to leave the apartment. Oh, you were still living there. That's not allowed. It's a new month. You're trespassing. Trespassing? But it's my house. Are you okay? Did you forget it was a company apartment I rented? I was the leaseholder so naturally, you can't live there anymore. That's ridiculous. How could you do this? I can't believe you didn't know. I'm not the one who should be accused here. Didn't I tell you that you can't just change the locks of a rental apartment? It's my house. I can change the locks if I want. Didn't you listen? It was my lease. And even if you were the leaseholder, the owner is the apartment manager. You can't change the locks without telling them. Is that so? Also, I ended the lease while you changed the locks. I was allowed to live there until this month. I was planning to return, 
but now you've unlawfully altered someone else's property, which could be criminal damage. Wait, why did you end it so early? Criminal damage? Is that why the police are at the front door now? I'm too scared to open it. Don't worry, it's probably not for trespassing or criminal damage. It's better to talk to them. Why do I know about the police? Because I reported you for filing the divorce papers yourself. It looks like you've committed crimes like forgery and fraudulent use of a document. Divorce papers can be filed by one person, but only with mutual agreement and personal signatures. Since you forged my signature and the witness, it's clearly a crime. Larry seemed unaware of his guilt. So, the divorce papers you submitted are invalid, and your marriage with Laura can't happen either. How do you know about Laura? Did you think I knew nothing? I hired a private detective agency to investigate your affair with Laura. It was a busy time at work, and coordinating with the agency was tough. Plus, you even held a grand wedding ceremony. While I was supposedly on a business trip, I actually took time off work to do some research and prepare documents because I knew about Larry bringing Laura home. It would have been impossible to gather this evidence while working. After I told Larry everything, he was speechless and seemed quite upset, even over the phone. Then he pleaded with me, please don't tell Laura I'm divorced. Why would I? There's no such fact to tell. Really, thank you. Are you misunderstanding something? When did you become divorced? That fake divorce paper is invalid, remember? So legally, you're still my husband, not divorced. What? So since you cheated while still legally my husband, Laura needs to pay compensation. I sent the demand for compensation to her house yesterday by express delivery. She didn't know you were married, right? Then I can't withdraw the claim at this point. I knew Laura believed Larry was single, but I deliberately sent the compensation demand. Laura hasn't contacted me yet, so maybe she hasn't received the letter. It should arrive soon. Should you be on the phone with me when you also have to deal with the police? You're busy. I'll ignore the police. I won't be arrested. I'm going to Laura's house now to get the letter back before she or her family can accept it. He then hung up and probably went straight to Laura's house to wait for the postman at the front door. I knew it would be futile because the letter was sent as registered mail to Laura only. Even if he waited for the postman, he couldn't receive it. A few hours later, a disheartened Larry called me. According to him, there was an incident when the postman arrived. Finally, I'll take that envelope. Who are you? You don't live here, right? I'm practically a resident here since I'm married. I have the right to receive the mail. I see, but I can't give you this envelope. It's registered mail for Laura only. What? Give it to me? Absolutely not. If you're so eager, ask Laura for permission. What's going on here? Oh, Larry, what's all this noise? Laura, this is registered mail for you. This man insisted on taking it. Sorry for the disturbance. What's this? A demand for compensation? Larry, you were married? What's going on here? Sorry, it's just, she's an ex-wife from a long time ago. I was embarrassed to say I'm divorced. I'm sorry for keeping it a secret, but isn't it strange? We haven't been dating long and suddenly there's a demand for compensation. If you were divorced before we started dating, there shouldn't be any problem, right? Well, my ex-wife is crazy. Maybe she's demanding compensation out of spite because I got married. That was the excuse he gave, but his lie was soon exposed. The envelope included a letter I wrote along with my contact information, so Laura called me directly. During that call, I told her about the affair, the invalid divorce, and that they had a wedding ceremony while he was still married to me. Although they had a wedding ceremony, they hadn't submitted the marriage registration yet. Larry wanted to submit it on April Fool's Day, so it was still pending. He probably delayed submitting the marriage registration because he was unsure whether the divorce was finalized. After being exposed, Larry left Laura's house and shamelessly contacted me again. I still had something to tell him, so we agreed to meet at a nearby cafe. 
As soon as I arrived, Larry said, Lisa, please withdraw the compensation claim. Let's pretend we've been separated for a long time and officially divorced now. I can apologize to Laura for being secretly divorced and maybe cover it up. Do you think I'm desperate to stay married to you? I was going to file for divorce anyway, but since you cheated, you'll pay compensation. Just trying to extort money from me, huh? Typical of the poor. You have such a poor heart, he said. You're talking nonsense. Depending on my answer, everything can change. There's still an option where we don't divorce if I say no. You can't reject it, meaning you can't marry Laura and your marital status will be exposed. Fine, I'll pay the compensation. Just divorce me now. Sign here. Then, about property division. Property division? How much more do you want to take from me? Compensation should be enough. Remember we agreed to waive property division, right? So let's make it official. All right, you're not as bad as I thought. Thank you. We then went to a public notary, made a public document for compensation and property division, and then to the city hall to submit the divorce papers, finalizing our divorce. Relieved, I exchanged final words with Larry. Glad we don't have to divide property. What are you saying? I'm the one who benefits from that. By the way, do you even have assets after paying me compensation? Laura will also claim damages. She mentioned charging you for the wedding expenses. That's impossible. I'm marrying Laura. She can't claim that we're divorced now, so there should be no problem. Still living in a fantasy, huh? You committed marriage fraud. You had a wedding while still married. Do you think Laura still believes you? Marriage fraud. That's ridiculous. Laura will believe me. Believe that if you want. I heard from Laura directly. Also, weren't the guests at your wedding paid actors? You still owe them, you know. You know about that? I haven't paid them yet. What does it matter to you? You could have just taken property division and been better off. That's what I wanted to tell you. Even if we had divided property, you would have benefited more. What are you talking about, poor woman? Your family is poor and you only make $230,000 a year, right? Even if you got a raise, it would be barely $30,000. You don't have any property. You keep calling me poor, so I thought you might be mistaken. Yes, my salary is indeed $145,000, but you know I work for a foreign company, right? It seems you have no interest in me, but I became a director of the American branch. It's not $145,000 per year, but per month. $170,000 per month, so that's an annual income of $2.5 million. You're still bad with numbers. How do you manage to keep a job? It's $2.5 million a year. $2.5 million? That can't be true. Of course, I haven't had the chance to spend such an amount, so I've been saving it for the future. The savings from before our marriage aren't part of the property division, but there's still a considerable amount since our marriage. So I could have received half of that in the property division. You were my wife after all. I'll get the divorce papers corrected. Are you okay? After all the contempt, you think I'd gladly undo the divorce if you have that much money? You don't need to claim compensation, right? It's just a small amount for you. He who laughs at one cent will weep for one cent. This compensation is for the mental anguish you caused me. I'd like to claim more, honestly. And since we've made it official, make sure to pay it, even in installments. I'll be penniless. Also, don't go back to that apartment. Your belongings should have been moved to your parents' house by now. You thought I had few belongings, but that was because I had already moved most of them. Were you that indifferent to me? I can have so little, so I have to go back to my parents' house. They don't know anything yet, do they? Let me explain. Don't say anything. I already told them everything. It's only fair to explain why we're divorcing. Oh, and your father said never to step over our threshold again, so I have nowhere to go. He collapsed and I left the cafe. Later, I heard he caused trouble at the police station. Despite my advice, he went back to the apartment. 
He just sat there aimlessly in the empty apartment until the manager called the police, and he was taken away. I'm not sure if it was for obstructing public duties, trespassing, or the falsified divorce papers. Eventually, his parents took responsibility for him. After talking with me and learning about Laura, they decided that apologizing and paying damages to Laura's family came first. They went to Laura's house to apologize, kneeling in front of her family. They settled everything without pressing charges for marriage fraud, even paying for the wedding expenses. I had expected them to sue, so it was disappointing they didn't. I decided to pursue legal action against him for forging the divorce papers. Larry offered a settlement, but I didn't withdraw the lawsuit. I didn't want him to think everything could be solved with money. I wanted him to be convicted and understand the gravity of his actions, even if it cost time and money. I left everything to my lawyer, so it wasn't too burdensome for me. Even though it took time, Larry, exposed for his actions and the marriage fraud, couldn't stay at his company anymore. After being detained by the police and subsequently absent without leave, he was eventually fired. He ended up living at his parents' home, working all day at a relative's construction company. His father took all his earnings, leaving him with no income. I thought his parents wouldn't abandon him, but they were stricter than I expected. They paid my compensation and Laura's compensation, planning to make him work hard until he repaid everything. He lived in a shed-like place with no electricity, receiving only $10 per day for food, deducted from his salary. They planned to kick him out once he'd repaid everything a harsh fate. After years of hard work, I was offered a position at the head office abroad, so I moved overseas after the divorce was finalized. I worried that Larry might come to me for help or harbor resentment, but moving abroad alleviated those concerns. Initially, I thought work would be my sole companion for a while, but life took an unexpected turn. I soon found myself in a new relationship. I am now dating a foreign executive at our head office. Things have progressed quickly and I'm pregnant with plans to marry soon. I shared everything about my past and my ex-husband with him, and he's been incredibly understanding and supportive. We've discussed our future together in depth. I'll be taking maternity leave soon, and we've planned for me to return to work afterward. He's enthusiastic about taking paternity leave and embracing the role of an active co-parent, which showcases a refreshing cultural perspective compared to what I experienced previously. My past experiences with my ex-husband were challenging, but now I finally feel like I'm on the path to true happiness. I am gaining confidence each day and moving closer to building the happy family I've always dreamed of. The journey here taught me a lot about resilience and the complexity of relationships. Many people endure suffering due to selfish partners, and while divorce isn't always the preferred solution, enduring in silence is certainly not a virtue. It's crucial to recognize that open and honest discussions can pave the way to meaningful resolutions. In some cases, divorce turns out to be a necessary decision for personal growth and well-being. This chapter of my life has reinforced that belief, helping me move forward with a new sense of purpose and hope for the future.